And so praise is an eternal operation. The angels have been given the assignment of praising God on high. Isaiah chapter 6, uh, the angels were there and uh, they praised God. They said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. And uh, Lucifer, the highest angel, was responsible for orchestrating praise. God made him a physical being, an angel, and, and it is said that his uh, physical being was made up of seven musical instruments. And he was made to praise God. I did not orchestrate tonight what the praise team sang, but they did sing a song that says, praise is what I do. And, uh, and that's what Lucifer did. He did praise. And he did it well. And uh, he was an influence and an example. And one third of all of the angels of heaven were in his watch and in his leadership to lead in praise and glory to God. And of course, you know the story. He somehow got the feeling that he might could taste some of this glory for himself. And uh, when he got off track like that, there wasn't a plan of redemption for angels. And I think that's one of the reasons the scripture says the angels would like to look into what we have. Because we have come from uh, the gutter. We have come from the dirt. And the Lord has redeemed us and has given us the destiny that goes past the angels. And uh, so they're kind of stuck in place. And if they made this mistake, it is a fatal mistake on their part. And they have no hope. And uh, I don't know how many angels God made, but it is implied that there are trillions of angels just in the one-third. And uh, they are all ministering spirits, and uh, they are now in a force that is ruled by chaos and contempt. So they are not in harmony. They don't get along. They are all fighting each other. And they are held at bay by forces and powers. And Lucifer, I suppose, is the head of all of that. He is not really in charge of hell. So you got to be careful when you uh, equate him with hell. He is going to be cast into hell. And hell is going to be cast into the lake of fire. Those are his final destinations. Uh, so he's not in charge there. Not just like prisoners aren't in charge of the prison. So, uh, but that is what, that was Lucifer's job. He was in charge of praise. It is the highest calling. There are two other levels, Michael and Gabriel. One for messages and one for uh, spiritual warfare. And so Lucifer's was the highest calling. Since he was displaced by his own actions, the Lord has called us to praise God. And so praising God is not just singing, it's not just your voice, but it is your life. Your life, your behavior, your conduct, everything that people see of you is a testimony about the goodness of God and about the greatness of God. And uh, God has made us awesome beings with an intellect and a choice. And so as we choose to praise God and respond to his request, uh, we are given emotions and feelings. And, and when we feel the presence of God and all of this is just an unbelievable orchestration of the spirit of God. When just like tonight we're having church and the Lord is moving across our uh, atmosphere and our presence and we're just we're just elated in the presence of God and it's only sort of a touch of a beginning of what it's going to be like but it is already the beginning of heaven we are already in the kingdom of God and we are already a part of what God is doing and praise is, is the atmosphere that is set and in the atmosphere of praise, I mean, I could preach about praise all night. There's all kinds of things to say, and uh, praise is an awesome thing. But in the atmosphere of praise, the Bible said the Lord inhabits that. But in the atmosphere of praise, there is the business of revelation. 
for revelation to take place, God's got to be present. Amen. Not just his, in his omnipresent state, but in, in the atmosphere of your mind and your, your intellect and your awareness of God. So sometimes in the office or in the car or wherever we might be studying, all of a sudden, you know, we'll say it in different ways. The light comes on, uh, a revelation hits us, something happens. It happens when we're praising God. Now we might not be, you know, praising Him on instruments. We might not be singing in church. We might not be holding a microphone. But, but we are in tune with the Holy Ghost, and our very being is is just longing and reaching and praising God. And in that, revelation can come. And when revelation comes, it opens up to your mind things you never thought of and you never dreamed of. And I have been in church all of my life. And I am still as excited as ever to go to church because I know that it could be a service where I hear something that I've never heard before. And I've heard a lot of preachers and a lot of awesome things. I'll never forget a general conference many years ago. Brother Glass got up. I don't know if you even know who that is, but he got up to preach. He was a renowned preacher from Texas and and he was assigned to preach at general conference and he got up and preached uh, on a scripture that sort of blew us all away. Uh, he said that the, the word is exalted above the name. And we are the people of the name. And the name that's above every name, Acts 4.12, is the name of Jesus Christ. Yes. And he pulls out a scripture that says that the word is exalted above the name. And preached the whole message and many times some of us have never heard of that before. It was a new lesson and of course as I preach Sunday night, uh, truth is the perfect alignment uh, of the oneness. Truth. When you embrace truth, it's a straight line. It's the shortest distance between two points. And so when you're trying to measure something, if it's going to be straight, you call it true. And that's what we talked about Sunday night. And so in the presence of God, you're going to receive a true revelation. How many would like to receive a revelation? For some people, maybe this revelation tonight won't be new, but for others, maybe they've never heard it before. And sometimes we get caught in church trying to fit the bill of entertainment by coming up with something that people have never heard before. But in fact, the Lord and the Bible is full of reminders of what we've heard before and how important it is. That's right. So don't get caught up in saying, well, I've heard that, so I'm turning it off. No, you might catch a new revelation about what you've heard before and understand that, like tonight, I'm saying that praise is the foundation of revelation. And in praise, you're going to receive a revelation that you never dreamed of when you begin to praise God. And then the revelation that God gives us is about our destiny. And we have an awesome destiny. And uh, we have not even imagined what all it's going to be. But I like to try. I like to try. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. So let me just draw a little illustration here for you, and that is that there is a, an atmosphere around the earth, and there are different levels, and at sea level, uh, there's a certain pressure, and uh, that pressure uh, uh, isn't any greater unless you go to Death Valley where it's like 212 feet below sea level. Uh, but then as you get higher, the pressure, the atmospheric pressure is less. And planes fly anywhere from 31 to 37,000, maybe 41,000 feet. And then there's some jets that'll go up to 60,000 feet. And at around 90,000 feet, uh, you're getting into outer space. And you got to be careful. You don't just 
bust through the envelope and get lost into outer space and all of these things have been discovered and in complete outer space there's no atmosphere and so objects travel at we have found at 17,000 miles an hour and the reason you can't travel that fast on earth is you don't have a propulsion system to make you go that fast number one number two the atmosphere would burn up whatever you were that's why when things return in the atmosphere they meteors and things that are coming into the earth the atmosphere burns it up usually uh, before it ever becomes very substantial and uh, of course the Bible says we're fixing to see some things like this happen that's going to be uh, larger but even small objects coming across the atmosphere, if they're big enough to last and make it to earth, they make a pretty big impact. It's pretty interesting. But there is a lid on uh, atmospheric possibilities. And... Uh, Paralleling that to the spiritual, there is no lid. There's no lid. You might right now in your beginning state, like the little worm inching its way across the, the street, uh, we're down here at zero uh, feet and we're at that pressure. And as we go higher spiritually, uh, there's no limit to how high we can go. We can go as high as we want. People have come in the church and asked me, you know, what can I do and what can I be? And uh, you can be anything you want to be. The limit is in your mind. And of course, I'm taking the lid off of this life and, and I'm not just including this life or this church or, or what, it, what we know as what the kingdom of God is. I'm trying to help you understand that there's no limit and eternity is out there forever and God's got some unbelievable revelations and awesome stuff that we're going to. Yes. Now, I'm not sure who all here believes me but I would hope that these young kids believe me. Amen. They hear all kinds of other stories in life that, that somebody's fiction and imagination has thought up. And tonight I want to tell you that in eternity you're going to be something you never dreamed you're going to be. And it's not so important that you know what it is. Because you don't know what tomorrow holds. And you don't know what you're going to be when you grow up. But when you get in the presence of God, you start feeling a destiny. You start feeling a revelation. You start getting a feeling of something just besides this earth. Something just besides this world. Something just besides the agenda that the world has. And all of a sudden now you're stepping into a different realm. This realm that we experience tonight in worship is different than what happens at a ball game. It's different than what happens anywhere in the world. And it involves the Almighty God. So there the destiny is showing up. And when he shows up, he brings everything that you're ever going to be with him. And you are literally walking and basking in the presence of your whole eternal existence. Now I can't go into the eternal part because it, it's past our mind's understanding. But just think about it. God's got awesome stuff out there. And it's waiting for you. So my number one point is don't sell out in this world to anything that would cheat you out of your existence. If the devil can get your mouth to use foul language and use the name of the Lord in vain, he can disqualify your praise. He can cheat you out of your destiny and out of your revelation. So I don't just behave verbally because somebody gave me a rule. I'm holding on to the word Jesus, the name Jesus, because it holds my whole future. So I'm not not just obeying a rule that my mom and dad said you better not use this name in vain I am holding it in sacred high degree because it is in worship the platform for my whole future for my whole understanding of what God wants to put
put in my life. It opens up a revelation so I don't want to let the world or the devil hurt my praise. He would like to shut your praise up. I don't think he's here tonight. I don't think he, he can afford to come around to a high-powered place where people are praising God and the presence of God is here. Amen. So I'm not really worried about that, but as you live your life, there's going to be many voices and there's going to be many calls and they're going to be trying to get you to do things and you got to understand that, that they're after the values that you possess. Sometimes you don't even know what values you possess. One of the things that little children possess that they don't know, that something inside their curiosity is, is dying to find out things that they don't know. But one of the things they possess is innocence. And any God-fearing adult is going to do their best to protect that innocence as long as they possibly can. And I can tell you that you can be innocent in many ways all the way to the grave. Because there's a whole lot of stuff in the world that I don't know about. I hear about stuff. People tell me this movie or that movie or, or this whatever, that whatever, this is on the internet, that, that. And, and I'm already set to where, you know what, I don't want to know. I don't need to know. I can't afford to sacrifice my relationship with God. I don't want to hurt my ability to lift up the name of the Lord and have heaven appreciate my voice. Amen. So children don't even know it, but they possess innocence. And we who are adults are interested in protecting that innocence. And I'm using that as an illustration because the devil's after whatever values you have. He's after the things that God has given you. One of the things, and I've mentioned this in recent preaching, one of the things the Lord has given you is a future. Yes. And that's an awesome thing to have. Yes. So the devil would like for you to think life is so bad you need to give up on it today and take your own life. And that is the most foolish thing you could do. Life is an awesome gift and it has awesome potential. And no matter how bad today is, it's not going to be this way forever. My brother's wife just had to have a major eye surgery and uh, I was praying for her and then I text him and I and I was looking for a spiritual insight to give and I put down something that's in the Bible a lot of times this too shall pass that's good to know about the time the Lord the devil's got a teenager thinking that it's the end and they might as well just forget it this too shall pass and tomorrow's going to be a better day and and all of your future that God has given you is a gift that the devil would like to steal so keep praising God and don't let the devil cheat you out of your future because in your praise is your destiny in your praise is your revelation in your praise is you finding out who you are and who you're going to be and God calls preachers like myself that started as a child he came on purpose that way himself so that he could relate to us but then he calls us pastors and we started as children and so I sat in church as a five-year-old as a six-year-old as an eight-year-old I I sat here and thought the thoughts that you're thinking and wondered the things that you're wondering and I wondered a whole long time what am I gonna do and what am I going to be? My mom just kept telling me, you're going to be great. And I kept thinking, that's because she's my mom and, and she's hoping for that. But I feel like nothing. But then I would touch God and I would feel his destiny and I would feel his revelation. But it was all foggy and I, I had no clue. I tell you, I had no clue. 
I saw little smidgets along the way of, of revelations and just sort of things that, that you can look back at and see and say, oh yeah, that must have meant this. But at the time, it's like a passing thought. But God's got plans for you. That's right. God's got revelations for you. God's got positions for you in his kingdom. Yes. Not titles, but influence and power. And, and I'm trying to put this on every last person in the building. Now, I got to tell you in the Holy Ghost that I'm more aware that the children are in on this more than adults tonight. But I want the adults to jump in on it too because you are just getting started. Right. It's good. You have no clue what God's going to do with you and you need to get rid of the feelings of your past. Yes. The yes. doubts and the unbeliefs. The voice that yes. speaks doubt that right. gives the evil report in your own head. You got to rebuke that. That's yes. good. And when you're praising God, that's taken care of. Because we don't sing the blues in church. We don't have songs about, I mean, I was driving somewhere today and there was a commercial between, it was a talk show, when they came on with a commercial, somebody was listening to country music and how somebody lost somebody and everything's going wrong and the guy ended up liking it. It's an advertisement for Geico Insurance or something. I don't know. <laughs> I just want you to know that God's got plans for you and it is unbelievable yeah. and you need to believe it. Yeah. You need to believe it. Yeah. So when you're praising God, these doubts are taken care of. Yes. Because we don't sing the blues. We don't, our, our music has an agenda. It is all positive on purpose. Right. Yeah. Now we're not the authors of the music. God is. Yeah. And the songs we sing are about his greatness and he is great and he's saved us and he's done great things for us and so we're not we're not coming up with this music but when you're praising God you're not complaining that's right that's right you know, complaining can put you down really fast. Yeah. Yeah. Counting your troubles can put you down really fast. Right. Talking about diseases or talking about things you don't like can put you down pretty fast. But when you're praising God, you're in the presence of God. It takes care of all the things that you're not supposed to be doing. And sometimes you have to make the mental adjustment of, you know, you're not feeling too good. You're feeling down or discouraged. And let me just give you some practical advice. Maybe you haven't eaten yet. El Monte Christian Academy for 35 years on Wednesday would always tell me, you're, you're grouchy on Wednesday. <laughs> and I was smart enough not to argue with him because that would prove it. <laughs> no, I'm not. So I just kind of smiled and said, whatever <laughs> but I guess they could see a difference so maybe if you're discouraged or down maybe it's a physical thing maybe you need a candy bar maybe you need to quit eating candy bars but after you've figured out all the physics don't let the devil get you to count your troubles. And if you're having a problem and you can't get it off of your mind, start counting your blessings. I'm talking about the power of praise. It, it sticks you into a revelation mode. And you start getting revelations right in the middle of a problem. Because you decided to praise God instead of. Okay, so let's look at some Bible examples. In the book of Acts, Paul and Silas are in jail. It's a big problem. Their backs are beaten. 
they're, they're in stocks and bonds. That's not financial. And, uh, and so they begin to praise God. They made the choice. We're not going to moan and groan and complain and cry and, and be upset at God. We're going to praise God. And all of a sudden, revelation starts taking place in the minds of the other prisoners, in their own minds. I'm not sure that this is something they did every day of their life. Now, all of a sudden, they're recognizing the power of praise. And it becomes so powerful, it shakes the prison down. But we're talking about revelation. The, the, the jailer pulls out a sword, and by the time it's over, they, they've been to his house to baptize him and his family. And a whole unbelievable, unexpected event takes place because of praise right. right so you praise God whether you feel like it or not because God's good we sing the song we praise him in the good times and the bad times we don't praise him in the bad times for the bad times just so you know you're not supposed to thank God for a flat you thank God in the bad times because he's God and he can fix the flat. He's God and so he's worthy to be praised. You're not thanking him for the bad times. It's just that you can't let bad times stop you from praising God. Amen. So praise opens up a revelation. And so don't let the devil cheat you out of what you have. You have innocence. You have destiny. You have revelation. You have a lot of things coming when you keep that praise in your heart. Amen. Now you can be praising God without verbally singing out loud, but it wouldn't hurt to sing out loud. You can be praising God in your mind just that work when you can't be talking out loud. The Lord knows the thoughts and intents of your heart. And so when you are connecting in the spirit with God, he is aware. And that's the atmosphere that a revelation is going to take place. So sometimes you just follow instructions. You just go with the crowd because this is a good crowd. It's church. But on all of a sudden, you get your own touch from God. You get your own praise from God. And the next thing you know, you start getting direction. Direction. Everybody say direction. direction. You can't just get your direction from me. You don't know how many times all these years people come up to me and say, Brother Cooperly, what am I supposed to do? Or what can I do? And I'm supposed to have all the answers. And, and I don't. I look at them and I'm just as confused as they are. I don't know what you're supposed to do. I've told the story here before, but way back in the 70s, Sister Pride came up to me and said, Brother Cooperly, I want to work for God. She was just a new lady in the church. And she ended up working for God here for like 30 years. And everybody didn't think of her any other way. But there was a day when she just walked up and she didn't have any job. She didn't do anything. She just showed up to church. And she, you know, and she's an older lady and I'm a young pastor. And she goes, Brother Cooperly, I want to work for God. What can I do? And I felt like patting her on the head and saying, I don't know. <laughs> and, and I'm candid enough to do that, so that's what I said. I said, I don't know, but God knows. And let's find out what God wants you to do. And the rest is an amazing story. But you don't get that complaining. Right. You don't get that gossiping. That's good. You don't get that being mad at God or life. You you get that praising God. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. All of a sudden, you know, we have Brother Winslow come or some other preachers that operate in the gifts a little bit. You know, you don't have a big argument and fight in church and say, okay, now Brother Winslow, take the pulpit. Let's see what God's going to say. <laughs> Probably nothing. Probably nothing. But if you praise God, if you touch God, you open up a revelation for your life, and the next thing you know, you recognize that, you know what, God's 
looking at me and I'm on his radar and God's got plans for me. Amen. Now we tell Bible stories and we look at the main guy and but you know there's a whole lot of other people in the picture that were just as great as the main guy. The Bible even says that. It says all of the volumes of the world can't tell the story. Right. So the stories that we got are to inspire us. But there was a little boy named David and by the time the story is over, the city of Jerusalem is called the city of David. Everybody say the city of David. David. And, and anytime you meet a Jewish person, their slogan is pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And that's what Jerusalem means, city of peace. But they call it the city of David. And, and how did that get to be? Because David had a destiny. Right. Now David wasn't perfect and that kind of comforts you a little because God's not looking for perfect people. He's looking for people that are going to praise him. And David praised God. Right. So David got revelations. Revelations. What revelation could you get? What should or could you do in your life? Sometimes we think we want to go somewhere else. There's something inside of us that says, I want to go somewhere else. But let me submit to you that God knows where he planted you. And that there's a lot of work to be done right where you are. And I don't live where you live. Those neighbors are not my neighbors, they're your neighbors. Right. People you go to school with, people that you work with, people that are hungry for God around you, the Lord needs you. And it's no big secret, but one of the biggest things that are in our destiny is reaching souls. Now, I like to help people. The main thing I like when people, when I help people is for them to be thankful. I like for people to be thankful. But I like to help people. And sometimes I've helped people and they, they couldn't help themselves. So they desperately needed help. But it's really neat to help people. It, there's something rewarding about it. I guess it's a certain kind of people. I guess some people don't want to help. I'll never forget, I, you know, I've been naive on my whole life. So I was on the job and this guy asked me help all the time so one time I asked him to help me and I was shocked <laughs> I mean I must have helped him like 20 times we're on the job could you help me sure I like to help so one time I said hey could you help me and, he, and I could tell you his name <laughs> he goes no sorry I have to take care of my own business. You take care of your own business. I thought, now wait a minute. <laughs> this is the guy that I help all the time. And it ain't coming back the other way. <laughs> and I thought, I don't mind helping people, but if they're not thankful, if, if it's not a two-way street, I like to help people. Amen. It feels rewarding to me. I don't know about all of you, if you're a person that doesn't really feel rewarded, and there's different professions. If you're a nurse, you like to help people. If you, there's certain professions that like to help people, there's other people, like if you're a doctor or paramedic or, you know, other, I mean, I... I feel sorry for the people at the DMV. I feel sorry for the people sometimes at the grocery store if they're just a clerk because they're helping people all day long and some of those people aren't very nice. A waitress. I'm not sure that I would deliver the food. I might throw it at them the way some people treat the waitress. But I enjoy serving. I enjoy serving. It's fun to serve. It's rewarding. But I just want to tell you, and you know this, but it's true. The most rewarding thing you will ever do in your whole life 
is to win somebody to God so that when they get when you get to heaven they are there and that it's very possible that if you hadn't done what you did they wouldn't be there it is a an eternal value that passes everything else in this world if you've passed somebody on the road that's got a flat because you're in a hurry and you figure somebody else is going to happen. If you see somebody getting beat up and you just don't have the guts to jump in and stop it. I mean, it tell me it happens all the time in life. I'm just telling you, those are wonderful things that if you made a difference, that would somebody would be thankful. But I'm talking about winning a soul is the most important thing you could possibly do. Yes, amen. Yeah. So for the last 30 years, people come to me and say, what can I do, Brother Coopley? And I say, teach a Bible study. I'm not going to ask tonight, but not very many people are teaching Bible studies. Now, when we praise God next time, I want you to ask God if you should teach a Bible study. Because you could get a revelation when you're touching God. You know how it is when you, you don't see somebody for a while and you think, I need to ask him this when you get there. Well, the next time you get in the presence of God, you need to ask God, God, should I teach a Bible study? <laughs> Who can I teach a Bible study to? I'd like to win somebody. You're not asking God for a wrong thing. You're asking God for his will. But you already know that. The Bible said he that win his souls is wise. I'm talking about when you're praising God and you stop to think what I just asked you to do, you're going to get a revelation. You're going to get a revelation. God's going to speak to you in the atmosphere of praise. And he's going to inspire you. Obviously. Me answering people for the last 30 some years. I mean I've been here 40. But I didn't always give them this answer. Sometimes I just looked at them. And, but, but for many many years I've been telling people. They come to me. Brother Cooperley I want to do something for God. Teach a Bible study. I mean, it's fellowship, it's food, but the Bible is the center, and you're planting eternal seeds, and you're going to win a soul. Amen. And there's nothing more important in the whole world. Right. Now, understand that they belong to God. They're not yours. So, if they don't make it, just tighten your belt and go on to the next one. Because it's between them and God, and it's not over till it's over. A revelation in the atmosphere of praise is going to be what you're supposed to do to win a soul. Well, that's true. Maybe it's not teach a Bible study. Maybe it's just witness. Maybe it's just pass out tracts. Sister B, is Sister B in the hospital? <clears throat> Sister Lupe, you're talking during church. <laughs> Sister, Sister Lupe, is Sister B in the hospital? Yes. All right. She called me Monday night, me and my wife, and talked to us in the car and said she was home. So, whatever. <laughs> but Sister B prints tracks and passes them out, right? Yes, she does. I'm not going to ask this. I'm not going to ask for a response. <laughs> I'm just going to leave this to your private mental thought. But how many people here think that they're smarter than Sister B? Don't answer. How many people think that you're maybe one rung up on the social ladder than Sister B? Don't answer. All I'm saying is, is you better watch out because Sister B wins souls. Right. Sister B does something wise. And you might look down at her and say, oh, she just simple old lady. All she can do is print up something and hand it to people. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> right. that might just be the revelation she got while she was praising God. Amen. And you haven't even got a revelation yet. So I'm saying in praise. 
Look for a revelation. That's good. Look for a revelation. Because in that praise and in that revelation is going to be your destiny. And destiny is too far out there for us to think of it out there too far. But your destiny, your destiny right here in life just in the next year is a good thing to look at. The next five years, what is your destiny? Right. One person in this church could turn this church upside down. Right. One person that figured out, you know what, I'm on God's side, he's on my side, I'm going to work for God. Yeah. One person could do that. And I'm not saying we're not. I'm thinking that we are exactly where we need to be in God. And God's going to send hungry people. God's going to send hungry people. And by the way, Brother Leonard, we have had people from this institute here for many years. They have gone back all over the world. Now you're familiar with who we are, but a lot of those people aren't. They have gone back all over the whole world and carried the gospel of Acts 2.38. And the name of Jesus Christ. And we have baptized them and they have gotten the Holy Ghost. I mean, we are not here by accident. And they are not here by accident. God put us here. And we're going to do our best. One thing about it, and that is that you're not under pressure to call your own destiny. You're not un under pressure to say what? All you need to do by the message for tonight is praise God. And when you touch God, it's just like receiving the Holy Ghost. You can't get the Holy Ghost complaining. You can't get the Holy Ghost feeling sorry for yourself. You can't get the Holy Ghost mad. You're going to have to get glad to get the Holy Ghost. Because it's the joy of the Holy Ghost. You're going to get the Holy Ghost by praising God. Truly from your heart thanking God. Because it's the will of God for everybody to have the Holy Ghost. So it's the same operation as getting the Holy Ghost. As when you touch the Lord and you're in the atmosphere of praise. It's time for revelation. You don't just sit there and say, oh, I feel so wonderful in the presence of God. No, you feel the presence of God. You ought to perk up and say, okay, God, what's next? Because I am open and ready for you to tell me what you want. Yeah. He might wake you up in the middle of the night and tell you. He might. But it's not going to be when you went to bed mad. It's going to be when you went to bed and said, God, I'm on your side. I'll be here in the morning. I love you. God's by now told me stuff all kinds of ways. In dreams, in visions, in the middle of the night, in the day. When I wasn't expecting it. There's a spot in their house that twice when I walked past there, the Holy Ghost hit me. I, is there anybody here that has truly been slain in the Spirit? I mean, you got knocked down. I went for many years without ever getting knocked down. I could buy it, but when Benny Hinn blows the whole section down, I'm thinking... <laughs> I wonder if he had a meeting with them all before church <laughs> I mean I believe God could do it but I'm not sure he's going to do it for that but I was kind of skeptical I walked past a spot in that house and I got knocked I mean the Holy Ghost hit me like you know you never know when destiny is going to show up, but I'm telling you, it's an opportune time when you're praising God. It's 
So we're going to sing praise is what I do, right? And our singers are coming back up. And just before we do, I'm going to tell you a destiny. Some of you have already heard this. But I'm looking forward to talking about it again. The Lord's getting ready to come any day. And right after the Lord comes, there's a, about a seven year period that's going to be devastation on this earth. And the Bible says that one-fourth of the earth is going to be killed. And there's close to 8 billion people on the earth right now. So one-fourth of that would be 2 billion. And in Revelation 6, 9, 2 billion people are going to be killed. So for people that believe that we're, that we're in the tribulation, when I see 2, be, two, two billion people get killed, I'm going to buy it. Otherwise, I don't believe we're in the tribulation. But in Revelation 6, 9, 2 billion people get killed. And in Revelation 9, 2 more billion people get killed. And when you started with 8 billion, now you have 4 billion. In 7 years. And those are just two events, not counting the rest of the destruction that takes place in the book of Revelation in those 7 years. I know I might be over your head, but follow me just for a minute. So, eight, four billion people are gone. Some of them went to heaven, most of them didn't. Four billion people now start a period in the Bible called the thousand years of peace. Billion with a B, four billion. I want you to think with me now about winning souls because we're just getting warmed up. Four billion people are going to live for a thousand years. The Bible says if one of them die, they're going to be a hundred years old. The devil is cast into the bottomless pit for this thousand years and Jesus is the king of the earth. And tell me how many people can 4 billion people have when the lifespan of the most of the people is a thousand years. So I'm telling all the tree huggers around this world today that are saying that the world's too crowded and there's no more room. You better read your Bible. Because during the thousand years of peace, four billion people are starting the production of people. And by the time it's over, it's going to be several hundred billion people. Now, what do people need? People need God, right? And the gospel is still the gospel in the thousand years of peace. So, when the Lord takes you to heaven, your next assignment is going to be to evangelize a hundred billion people during the thousand years of peace. Because he says we're, we're going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. I'm talking about your destiny. You think you're just one person and you don't really matter for much. Well, God's got such a big thing coming that he's going to need everybody on board. Right. Now, the scripture to prove this is number one. Genesis. The Lord told Abraham, your children is going to be as the sands of the sea and the stars of the sky. That's a That's a lot. That's a lot of children to represent all of the sand, but there's a whole lot of time in eternity, right?
And then in the book of Revelation chapter 20, he said, at the end of the thousand years, the devil's going to be loosed again. And he's going to tempt people. And the number of people that turn against Jesus Christ at the end of the millennium is a number like the sands of the sea and the stars of the sky. The Bible says in Revelation 20, the number is so big, they can't be numbered. All I'm saying is, is in just a few years, if you're saved and serving God, your destiny is going to be involved in reaching billions of people. Your destiny. Everybody say, my destiny. If you're going to be a soul winner in the millennium, you might want to start getting familiar with it right now. Because we have the largest district in the United Pentecostal Church, North America here in Southern California with 26 million people and we brag about that 26 million people doesn't hold a candle to a billion and the thousand years of peace starts with four billion people having kids and not very many of them are gonna die so by the time of four billion people have kids for a thousand years There's going to be so many people around here. And yes, Jesus is the king. But everybody's a witness. And that's your destiny. You're going to work for God. So I want to... I mean, I got that revelation from God, okay? I've never heard it in my life. I got that revelation from God. And that's not the last one he's got to give. You praise God right now, you're going to get a revelation of something. Maybe even that one I just gave because it's not that easy to understand, but you might. You might just get a picture of an overwhelming harvest that God's waiting to reach. People need Acts 2.38 even in the millennium. So praise is what I do. God about our death. 